Okay, so the next part is the self-reflections. Thus far, your extensive publishing career includes, to date, approximately 200 publications that have been collectively cited more than 25,000 times. Yeah. <laughs> That's I a didn't lot. Know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> the rate of citations are going up now with these companies that are the Google. Yeah. Yeah. You have invited. You have been an invited lecturer, visiting scholar, keynote speaker, etc., at universities in Italy, Belgium, England, Portugal, Chile and more than 20 other countries. Very large international corpus of work. You served as the president of the American Educational Research Association, AERA, which we discussed prior. And you're also a member of both the National Academy of Education and the International Academy of Education. In addition, you've received numerous awards and honors for your research, including but not limited to the Lifetime National Associate of the National Academy of Sciences, fellow of both the American Psychological Association and American Association for the Advancement of Science, award for distinguished, distinguished contributions to research and education, and the Wallace Foundation Distinguished Lecture Award, both of which are very prestigious awards um, bestowed upon you from AERA, the Edward L. Thorndike Award from the American Psychological Association, others both nationally and internationally. So what's next? What else would you like to accomplish in your career that you have not yet accomplished? <laughs> well, my husband says, you should face facts. You're about to turn octogenarian. You don't have to accomplish <laughs> anything more. <laughs> That's not gonna sit easily with you, I have a feeling though. Probably not, but <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with, with my age and no longer holding formal power over anybody. <laughs> uh, I, but I think I told you this already. W what I know is, what I think I know, is that people are much, are potentially much smarter than they become as a result of the schooling that we now offer, mm. as, as a general statement. I, and except for people like us who live Li have lived in learning and university environments most of our lives, uh, they don't get much chance to become smarter and smarter. Although they are, as let's say first radio and then television, mm -hmm. changed dramatically the levels of speech and language in essentially every sure. developed country. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, but now we know something that really can produce, can, it can change intelligence. Uh, it has to be that, or it couldn't be that by doing some science problems I got better at English language. Something is happening that goes beyond just learning whatever we taught you. That's what we mean by intelligence, right? I mean, mm. it's, mm -hmm. I, we think we know some portion of what that is, which is that you can reason and argue about ideas. Uh, and what we're seeing is that the culture is not taking this idea of accountable talk as we mean it. It's taking it, it it's picking out the social aspects of it. That, that, especially in America. I mean, it's, it's just astonishing to read the stuff that's out there on the web where various either publishers or freewheeling educators are offering their services and what, what they're saying. Mm. Some of them are terrific, but you, you, if you didn't know better, you could easily pick someone who would do wonders, maybe, for the social relations in your school, but not much for the intellectual life. The cognitive part. Right. Right. So that's the problem I want to try to solve. And it's not just a scientific problem. It really is a social action problem. So that keeps the two halves of my lives going. <laughs> Perfect. What, of what are you most proud in terms of your corpus of work? through your career? I like most of it. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Okay. 
All right, so now to a set of introspective questions. Who do you believe has had the greatest impact on you and the person and scholar you have become today? Well, I've named most of them over the course okay. of, of this. And even the, like the break with Fred Skinner. Sure. That, that was a big influence too. I learned that stuff and, for, and it was deeply interesting. Uh, even though I wrote about it in a way that he didn't like. And, uh, and for about five years, I continued to work that way. Um, and I also became part of Jerry Bruner's <laughs> crowd. Uh, I was never his closest. I, I wasn't a real student of his ever, is what it amounts to. I mm. was a, a, a very junior colleague. Um, Bob Glazer was a great partner for a long time. Sure. Uh, and and just made a place here where I was able to blossom. Great. I don't know. Ask, I mean, okay. Those are some some of the people. Perfect. And and you you mentioned Alan Newell and Herb Simon, but in fact Alan Newell and I had a little special thing. Okay. So did so did Herb and I, but w with Alan it was much more surprising because I really did not know much at all about about computer science and that was what he was doing he he, uh, he was I got the first phone call when I moved to Pittsburgh from him he had read the article and the two letters to the editor that sure. had been the response to Jerry Bruner I don't know how he got it one uh, some graduate student gave it to him I uh, and he said you know we're starting the first ever cognitive science summer school here this summer. You belong at it. We'll waive all the fees. We want you there. And I said, you know, all the right with the things you say to this distinguished professor, who I don't think was much older than me, actually. <laughs> I can't remember. Ten years older, maybe sure. he was. It's about all. I, and I said, look, I just moved here with two little boys. My husband is fully committed daytimes and and I don't yet have any backup. So I, I have to say, no, it's a great invitation, but I can't do it. And he said, well, what about if you tried to do most of the assignments and came whenever you could and then talked with me uh, at least twice a week or as many times a week as you want by phone? I, I said, OK, that, that, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, so how do I call you? He said, well, I want you to call me late at night because that's when everything else has died down. Said, How late at night? He said, as late as you want. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just I can't do that. You have to find a way to give me some more limits. He said, I have an idea. I'll call you back tomorrow. Now, this was after calling me back once already to tell me I could join the symposium, the seminar without being there. Uh, th so this was the next night. Call me back tomorrow. I have an idea. Or I'll call you, which he did. He said, I've arranged for you to have an account on ARPANET, which at the time, was, do you know what ARPANET is? Mm -mm. It's ar Armed Services. It was, it was the beginning of the military's investment in computer science. Oh, okay. And and they were investing in the most up-and-coming computer scientists. They weren't yet investing in education. They did later. Uh, and so the first thing that the computer science suggested was setting up an internet that could be the way they would communicate with each other and with the senior military people. Uh, and that was going, and you couldn't get into it unless you were some kind of senior mucky muck at, mm. at a university or in the armed services. Uh, but he managed to get me an account in 1965, so I could tell whether he was awake at night. <laughs> but of course, once I was on, I could roam around a little bit and see what other people were discussing. Sure. And I did. I didn't understand most of it, and I never did join in those conversations. Later, I did. I had money from the from a couple of different branches of the armed services, and I had to go to their meetings. So I 
learned that there were really smart, interesting people working mm. in that, those places. Uh, but at this point, all he wanted to do was let me get on, onto the internet of the day so that I would know whether he was still logged in, that which meant he was awake and I could call him. <laughs> that oh, was sure. the purpose. <laughs> 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 so there were all those things. This city was a provincial town at the time that had two universities about to burst into uh, national and international visibility. The other one's Carnegie Mellon. Right, right. Across the street. <laughs> what what inspires you? Well, I don't know what you mean. Everything. Everything. No, I mean, not everything. That's what I mean. Not, not everything. Okay. What do you find uninspiring? Trying to do things the way they've always been done and with the people who've always been done. Perfect. So I'll tell you a story, but I don't want it on tell. On, on, but after we. After we, okay. What is your favorite word? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, I think if things had been different, I would have become a mathematician. Mm. But they weren't different. I went to Harvard, and I didn't like the math class because it was all just routine problem solving. So I went to see my advisor at Radcliffe and said, I really don't like this class, what can I do? She asked me why, I said, well, I'm just doing the equations they give me, I can do them, but they're not interesting. She said, oh honey, girls don't have to be good at math. Why don't you just drop out and take something more interesting? Mm. We're still in an ad dropout period. So I said, yes, I mean, that's what I did. Mm. So I never got into the math, which I think I probably would have really loved. Particularly the cognitive side that you built from, from that point on. Yeah. What profession other than your own would you have not liked to attempt? I don't know. I don't think about <laughs> what, <laughs> no, you, what you what regret. Well, I guess yeah. that wouldn't be a regret. That's something yeah. else. Um, if you could tell President Obama one thing, what would it be? Keep going. I mean, I don't mean on your way out. If I could have told right. him that two or three years ago, I would have said that would keep going. Okay. If if you could have dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? I don't know. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? How do you know it? How do you know it? <laughs> Perfect. Finally, what advice might you offer to graduate students in particular? who hope to make a contribution like you to the academy. D dig in and do it. Get yourself more than one mentor. Don't, don't get tied to one person. And just do the work and get them to guide you, but not take it over for you. And Perfect. In closing, when asked to capture the essence and nature of Dr. Lauren Resnick, your colleague and friend, Dr. Carolyn Rose, describes her admiration of you for making education better. She remembers from her postdoc years here. Yeah, she was, he she was here. here, yeah. Not yes. working with me. Your voice in the midst of a seminar talk always seemed to bring wisdom from afar, gathered through your extensive travels. Hearing your wisdom always stirred in her a desire to grow up and be like you. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> your colleague and friend, Dr. Clotilde Pontecorvo, characterizes you as not only having an open mind while being, being highly educated in many fields, but also as a person who tries to get together for work, opportunities for amusement, for listening to and practicing good music, and for physical exercise. She describes you as her best friend in the United States and explains that you have a long history of friendship and scientific oh, yeah, collaboration. Oh yeah, we do. We've gone to each other's children's weddings. Oh, and we fabulous. Once, she and her husband before her husband died. We traveled together in Mexico for a while. Yeah, we had a wonderful. Lot of fun. Your colleague and friend, Dr. Mary Kay Stein, praises you for being internationally famous and having managed to raise two wonderful sons, and notes that you are exceeding close to your grandchildren as well. She describes you as focused, wicked smart, passionate about knowledge, and ahead of your time. Your colleague and friend, Dr. Anne Nelly Perret Clermont explains that you first met as colleagues and immediately felt as if you had known each other for a long time. 
a feeling of friendship that deepened each time you met professionally and personally. In many ways, you were like a dear old sister to her, yeah, even if, in fact, you weren't raised in the same family or academia and haven't even met that often. But when occasionally you have the opportunity to talk on the phone, you always have the feeling of pursuing a conversation that was inadvertently stopped only a few days before. <laughs> Your She's very poetic. <laughs> Your colleague and friend. And she wrote this in English, too? Uh, he, she did. Your colleague and friend, Dr. Charles Perfetti, describes you as indefatigable, always in motion, always thinking, usually talking. You are an intellectual, <laughs> but also a storyteller. You are practical, but you love a good theory. He captures your essence and nature based on the letters in your last name, adding that you are a R, reformer, E, educator, S, scholar, N, noetic, I, improver, C, collaborator, and K, knower. That's Resnick. For what you. was the N? The, the N, yeah. noetic. I don't know what that one is. I don't know what that one Yeah. <laughs> Poetic, but noetic. Okay. Your colleague and friend, Dr. David Clark, suggests that we should not be fooled from your charm and your smile. You are smart, inventive, focused, and tough. And finally, your former postdoctoral student, Dr. Baruch Schwartz, characterizes you, first of all, as a leader. You put this leadership in the service of your high societal ideas. Scientific knowledge should be disseminated among many. And you see your mission to apply what you search for in the service of social wel welfare. In a nutshell, leadership, generosity, and commitment to social welfare represent the essence of your nature. One last person, your colleague and friend, Dr. James Greeno, characterizes your personal and professional co contributions to the field, describing you as a humane, caring, and deeply intellectual person. He notes that the field of learning science is different and better because of your contributions to its advancement. Wow. That's um, nice. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of all of us, educators, scholars, future educationists, educational researchers, and the like, we thank you, Dr. Lauren Resnick, for everything you do and most for being you in the Ad Academy of Education. <laughs> okay. So thank you very thank much. You.